Hey guys, this video is on periodic properties of the elements. First we're going to talk about what are called valence electrons. And what valence electrons are, these are the outermost electrons in an atom. The outermost electrons are ones that are in the highest occupied N, or energy level. Um, because N tells you how far out from the nucleus the electron cloud extends, the electrons with the highest N extend out the farthest, and they are the valence electrons. This is important to us because that's where the chemistry happens. When two atoms or molecules come together, basically what they do is their valence electrons interact and the chemistry happens. Um, to tell which electrons are valence electrons or how many valence electrons an atom has, um, you can look at the electron configuration. For example, silicon, whose electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2, the highest occupied n is n equals 3. Remember guys, these numbers in front of the letters give you n. The highest n is 3. We have 2, 4 electrons in that n, so silicon has 4 valence electrons. Um, iron, for example, its electron configuration is argon, 4s2, 3d6. Now the highest occupied n is 4, and so iron has 2 valence electrons. As a matter of fact, guys, most transition elements have 2 valence electrons other than the exceptions, for example, chromium, which is argon, 4s1, 3d5, has one valence electron, for example. Those are valence electrons. Now, in the peri most periodic tables, and the periodic table that I give you guys for exams, um, it's for all of the main block elements, that is for the, the s block and the p block, um, you can tell right away how many valence electrons all the elements in that column have because it's the numbers before the a's. So 1a says that everything in this column has one valence electron. 2a, two valence electrons. 3a, 3, 4a, 4, so on. Now remember, even though helium is over here, it doesn't have eight valence electrons because it only has two electrons. It has two valence electrons. But other than that, the noble gases have eight valence electrons. Next, effective nuclear charge. Um, this is the amount of positive electric charge that an electron in an atom feels, and that's kind of in quotes, that it interacts with. Um, Z effective, so Z, that's, that stands for effective nuclear charge. It's equal to Z. Z is the um, atomic number. It's the number of protons. You know, um, minus something called a shielding constant, sigma. Um, don't worry, we're not going to do any calculations with this equation. This is just describing uh, qualitatively what's going on. Um, so buried in this constant here, guys, are two effects called shielding and penetration. And we're going to talk just a little bit about them and how they occur. So <clears throat> shielding um, is basically it's um, repulsion. If we have two electrons that are in the same orbital, um, they can interact. And because they're both negatively charged, they repel each other. And that destabilizes them, makes them... Um, um, easier to remove actually. So for example, in a neutral helium atom, two protons, positive two charge, two electrons, it takes 3.94 times 10 to the minus 18 joules to remove one of those electrons because it's partially being repelled by this other electron. That's kind of counteracting the attraction that it has for this opposite charge in the nucleus. Remember, opposite charges attract. Now once we take that one electron away, we have one electron left. Now there's no more um, shielding in this case because there are no more electrons um, in the same orbital or between this electron and the nucleus. And so this feels the full two positive charge. And it takes more energy to remove this because it's held more strongly. It does not have that repulsion of the other electron, 8.72 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. Um, that's shielding. I'll talk about penetration in just a second. But in general, the trend, so what we're doing in this video is we're trying to um, um, understand the trends of these properties we're going to talk about. And always talk about how they change as they go up and to the right in the periodic table. So as you go up and to the right in the periodic table, so you go across a row and up a column, um, in general, the Z effective, the effective nuclear charge, increases. And that's going to be important right there. So remember this, guys, because we're going to use this to explain a lot of stuff in this video. Um, so now penetration. So um, remember the, when we looked at the um, radio probability distribution functions. Um, for example, in this graph over here, if 
if you look at the um, radial probability of a 2s electron, um, it looks like this. Um, remember the nodes here and, and all this. So this is distance from the nucleus. So if you see this, this red bump right here, we can see that the 2s electrons have some probability of being inside of where the 1s electrons are and the 2s electrons. That little bit of um, uh, probability or, or, or extension of the electron cloud inside is called penetration. And what happens is when that, what those electrons get in that far, or, um, or that part of the electron cloud extends in that far, um, it sees more positive um, charge. So um, that's the opposite effect of shielding. The more penetration there is, the, the higher the effect of nuclear charge. The um, more shielding there is, the less effect of nuclear charge. So if we look over here, this is just the same idea, looking at a 3s versus a 3p versus a 3d orbital. The 3s extends inside of the 3p and 3d, um, which is why it's lower in energy. An electron in a 3s orbital is lower in energy than one in a 3p or a 3d. So, first, um, other than, okay, so the first property that we're going to talk about and its trend in the periodic table is atomic radius, the size of an atom. So that's the distance from the center of the nucleus to the outside of the atom. And that's not as simple as it sounds, because, because remember, those electrons have some non-zero probability of extending out to infinity. So, you know, where is the end of the atom? And there's a couple ways to do it. Um, one way to um, describe the, the radius of an atom is to um, look at a covalent bond between two like atoms, so say two chlorine atoms, right? And if we look at the Cl2 molecule, the distance between one nucleus and the other, take that distance and divide it by two, that's something we can measure. We, we can measure that, we have the tools. The, dis the half that distance would be what we call the covalent radius. Um, but either way, um, the general trend in the periodic table is that because effective nuclear charge increases up and to the right, so if we go this way to the right and up, the effective nuclear charge increases, the greater the effective nuclear charge, the more tightly those outer electrons are held, they're pulled in more strongly, which makes that um, atom smaller. And so the trend with the radius, atomic radius, is that the radius, the atomic radius decreases, gets smaller as you go up and to the right in the periodic table. Um, this is just showing the effect of nuclear charge um, on these, these atoms, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, and it's increasing as we go to the right, and the radius, this is a picture of the radius, decreases as we go to the right in the same row. Ionization, this is the next property. So atomic radius decreases up and to the right because effective nuclear charge increases up and to the right. Ionization energy, um, the first the definition, it's the amount of energy required to remove the outermost electron from a gaseous atom. So for example, if we take a gaseous potassium atom and measure how much energy it takes to remove its outer electron, that amount of energy is its ionization energy. Actually, it's what we call the first ionization energy because we're removing an electron from a neutral atom. We can do the same thing. Once we've removed that one electron, we can take that ion that we formed and remove another electron. The amount of energy it requires to do that is the second ionization energy. Um, and we have third and as many electrons there are. And now, as we go from first to second to third for the same element, ioniz the, the second ionization energy is always larger than the first ionization energy, and the third is always larger than the second and so on. But we can do better than that. Um, because effective nuclear charge increases up and to the right, and effect, um, first ionization energy um, is a measure of how much energy it takes to remove an electron, the greater the effective nuclear charge, the more strongly that electron is held, and that means the greater the first ionization energy. So the trend first for first ionization energy is that it increases up and to the right. However, there are some bumps. If we look at, let's say, the second row, so these, these, are, this, these are the first ionization energies for the elements in kilojoules per mole. Lithium is 520, we go to beryllium, it increases 900. But then, look at this, we go to boron, and it decreases, but then it starts going up again, and then up again, 
And then it goes down and then up and up. What? That's not a trend. Well, yeah, it is because we can explain it. And we can explain it if we look at, guys, the electron configurations. So everything in the, um, the second column, in column 2A, has an electron configuration. The last electron to go in there is something S2. So beryllium would be you know, 1S2, 2S2. And it ends up, okay, now this is a, in white here, this is a um, property of, of atoms that's, that explains quite a few things. Full and half full subwells have a special stability, and that means they're hard to break compared to electron configurations that do not have a full or a half full sublevel. Watch. So if we look at beryllium, its electron configuration is 2s2, so it um, has two electrons in the 2s sublevel. That's a full sublevel. Um, the first ionization energy talks about the amount of energy to remove one of these electrons. If we do this, okay, to take one of these electrons out, we're breaking a full sublevel. And that's um, harder to do than for um, boron, um, which it has a um, neither full nor half full sublevel up here. And But if we remove this electron, we end up with a full sublevel, the 2s. And so because we end up with a full or a half full sublevel, and we start with one that's neither full nor half full, it's easier to remove the electron, the last electron, the 2p electron from boron, than it is to take the, one of those 2s electrons from beryllium. Now sure, we do end up with a half full subshell with beryllium, but it's um, still much easier to remove that electron from boron because we start with neither a full nor a half full, and we end with a full sublevel. Um, we also see this little bump over here going from um, column 5a to 6a, nitrogen to oxygen. Same idea. Nitrogen has a half full sublevel. There's one electron in each of these 2p orbitals. And so that's hard to break. Um, if we take one of these out, now we don't, we have neither a full nor a half full sublevel here. But if we look at oxygen, um, it has. Um, an electron configuration is 2s2, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So it starts with neither a full nor a half full sublevel, but when we take this one electron out, and this is the one that will come out, we end up with a half full sublevel. Easier to do that than it is to break that half full sublevel. And so the first ionization energy goes down when we go from column 5a to column 6a. All right, so that's first ionization energy increases in general up and to the right, except going to columns 2a to 3a and 5a to 6a, and this is why. <clears throat> now, if we look at the um, consecutive ionization energies, first to second to third and fourth, so in this, this um, chart here, um, this column is the first ionization energy, second, so IE2 is the second, IE3 is the third ionization energy, removing the amount of energy required to move the, remove the third, and so on. These are kilojoules per mole. Um, these are the elements. Um, these are the, the number of protons, the atomic number Z, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So lithium, okay, to remove that first electron, goes to um, from 1s2, 2s1, to 1s2. Not too bad, we end up with a full sublevel. But when we go from the next one, okay, when we break, when we go from lithium with a plus charge to lithium with a plus two, remove that second electron, we have a very large jump. It's not just, you know, I mean, it always gets larger. This is going from 500 to 7,000, more than tenfold. And the reason for that large jump is basically the octet, will, will, we're breaking this full sublevel. Um, 1s2 now becomes 1s1. Hard to do. And then, sure, the third ionization energy, taking this last electron out is hard, 11,000 kilojoules, but it's not, you know, a tenfold jump like it is from um, the first to the second. And so if, when you follow this down, this this is, as we go from the unshaded to the shaded areas, we always, we're breaking an octet. Um, and that's the octet rule. Okay, the next property so um, is electron affinity. And this is the energy change associated with the addition when you add an electron to a gaseous atom. For example, taking a gaseous bromine atom, adding an electron to make the uh, 
bromine minus ion, the anion, in the gas phase. It's not bromide, it's bromine, the, the, the anion bromide, bromine. Um, now, um, in, so first of all, the trend is it increases up and to the right um, in general, with some exceptions. Um, but watch out for the signs. Okay, so we have these are the um, electron affinities for the elements, and a lot of these are negative because it, when you add an electron to an atom, you're bringing a negative charge closer to a positive charge, the nucleus, and that releases energy. Um, so, like, let's look at the second row again. Go from lithium, negative 70 kilojoules per mole, to add an electron, to brillium, 240 kilojoules. And this is calculated, but it's still probably pretty close. Um, now it's positive, so we have to force that to happen. Uh, and the reason is this. Same idea as we were just talking about, but you have to be careful about like where you're starting and where you're going. Instead of taking an electron out, what we're doing is we're adding an electron. So for lithium, it starts out at 2s1. And so when we add an electron, we end up with a, um, a full sublevel. We end up with, a, with 2s2. It's pretty easy to do. But beryllium, when we add another electron, couple things happen. So now, okay, this would be beryllium, neutral beryllium. Now the electron affinity talks about the amount of energy to, required to add another electron to this, to put one up here in this 2p um, orbital. So first of all, we end up with neither a full nor a half full sublevel. Harder to do. Plus, we have to overcome all of that, um, that shielding from these, these electrons that are already there. Um, Plus, we're going, we're jumping up a sublevel from an S to a P. It's higher in energy, um, so it's, it's hard to do. So, I have to add an electron to beryllium to make it 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. It actually, it's it's really hard to do. But then we keep going, and the, and we it gets more and more negative until we go from carbon to nitrogen, 4a to 5a. Same idea. Carbon, okay, its electron configuration. Everything in this column is something. S2, P2. So we look for, for example, carbon 2S2, 2P2. Um, when we add that next electron, which is what electron affinity talks about, we end up with a half full sublevel, like this right here. That's pretty easy to do. So carbon negative 123 kilojoules per mole, or 123 kilojoules per mole is released when we add that electron. But nitrogen starts out with a, a half full sublevel, the 2P sublevel. To add an electron to that, we have to break that that sublevel, that half full sublevel, and end up with a neither full nor half full. It's hard to do, and so it's about zero, right? Roughly balanced. But we still see that trend. It's the electron affinity becomes less negative as we go from 4a to 5a, and then it starts becoming more negative. Um, now, when we get to the noble gases, it's the same idea. These already have the full; all the sublevels are, levels are full. That's that's really what the octet rule is talking about. Um, atoms want to be like noble gases because noble gases have entirely full sublevels. That's the most stable place you can be. So it's hard to do this. So the trend for electron affinity is it increases up and to the right, except for these exceptions we talked about, going from 1a to 2a, 4a to 5a, and this is the reason why. And the last thing is something called diagonal relationships. So what we, what we have now is, in general, we can predict um, the relative um, atomic radii, first ionization energies, and electron affinities um, based on the positions of the elements in the periodic table with those exceptions. Remember those exceptions, okay, guys? And remember why they occur. Um, now, if we have two elements that are diagonal to each other, for example, if you look at a periodic table, lithium and, lithium and magnesium are um, diagonal, beryllium and aluminum, boron and silicon. When, so now it, going up and to the right, so magnesium is to the right, but lithium is up, right? So um, it ends up that when they're diagonal like this, you know, adjacent at that, that corner there, um, then those, the values are roughly similar. So we can predict they'll have roughly the same, roughly the same atomic radius, first ionization energy, and electron affinities. And the reason is they have basically the same, we're really close, so, um, effective nuclear charges. That's all there is to it, guys.